and cognitive outcomes. They function better at school. They show less emotional and behavioral problems. They develop more relationships with peers and they are more often securely attached. Consequently, they are more likely to grow up into well-functioning adults. Yet, foster care faces serious difficulties. There seems to be a technical problem. Four I'm pretty average. The average age of a kid in foster care. From the majority background of kids in care, having experienced abuse and neglect from those with protection, I am nine times more likely to commit crimes. 25% more likely to get pregnant as a teenager. And there's a 30% chance that when I have children, I too will lose them. This is who I am until someone breaks the cycle. Foster children manifest serious behavioral problems that are often seen as a consequence of stressful experience in their past such as abuse, neglect, and inevitable parenting. An analysis of the history of foster children shows that 24% have been physically, 31% emotionally, and 14% sexually abused. About 60% of these children have been neglected, and 36% have witnessed severe domestic violence. If the placement of itself is not taken into account, 85% of the Flemish foster children have been exposed to multiple traumatic events, and almost one third show symptoms of traumatic stress. It often concerns complex trauma histories in the context of the child's relationship with the primary caregivers, often of an invasive, interpersonal nature and with wide-ranging long-term impact. Besides support for foster parents, Many of these children are in need of trauma treatment, but only a few are treated. In addition to normal treatment, foster children undergo at least one and often numerous caregiver transitions. Only one third of the foster children that is placed, or one third of the children placed in foster care, has no placement history. One third has been placed one time before and one-third has been placed up to eight times before. Many of these transitions occur due to crisis situations without warning the child and result in immediate loss of contact with prior caregivers, sometimes permanently. Exposure to traumatic events, to unpredictable and sometimes frightening caregiving, and multiple transitions interfere with the child's ability to form secure attachment bonds. Indeed, research has revealed that foster children are at risk for developing insecure ambivalent and insecure violent attachment. And they are two times more at risk to develop disorganized attachment relationships than non foster children. Disorganized attachment is considered the most insecure type of attachment and has been associated with severe externalizing behavior problems and child psychopathology. In particular, home treatment is associated with disorganized attachment, while experiences of parental neglect are associated with insecure and neglected attachment. As a consequence, foster children are at risk of manifesting emotional and behavioral problems. In Flanders, more than half of the foster children had serious behavioral or emotional problems. How do foster parents experience this? And then, I am a few of you. Maar nu begint hij zo in de puberteit te komen en merk je dat al het gedrag van daarvoor komt eigenlijk een stuk terug. En dan merkt je, maar dan met de puberteit erbij nog een stuk erger, nog een stuk niet er bovenop komt. En dan onderwijs je het van nu, nu gaat het echt niet meer, je begon weg te lopen. Dus je bent aan het wandelen in de stad en opeens begint hij te lopen en weg te zijn. En dan loopt hij daar met nog twee kleintjes en ja, begint maar. Ja. 
Wat kon hij ook doen? Is bijvoorbeeld drie dagen naar de muurstand kijken en niks antwoorden, niks zeggen, niks zo een stuk ap apathisch. En ja, ook na een aantal vrijheidjes te bijden en het leuk vinden. En toen had wij zoiets van, ja, dat is eigenlijk helemaal terug naar af. Dan moet het echt wel... Ja, dan moet het echt wel... De moeilijkste komen. momenten zijn de complete afwijzing die je krijgt. Dat je het gevoel hebt als spreekhouder. Um, ik doe hier bijvoorbeeld alles voor dit kind. Ja. Maar alles is misschien relatief, maar uiteindelijk um, stik je, uh, ben je er dag en nacht mee bezig. Vraagt dat heel veel energie. Doe je dat ook ontzettend graag, want uiteindelijk zie je dat kind graag en, en kies je er ook voor om haar een betere toekomst te geven. En heel vaak lukt dat, maar ook heel veel momenten zijn er van totale afwijzing van ik haat u, van jij verbrot mijn leven, uh, ik wil hier absoluut niet wonen. Dat zijn ontzettend lastige momenten, omdat dat u als, uh, mij in elk geval als pleegmama heel hard raakt, omdat ik het gevoel heb van Potverdorie, uh, niet dat je dankbaarheid verwacht van, van het kind, maar zo die complete afwijzing vind ik. Uh, in het begin ging dat goed, maar dan uh, achteraf komen natuurlijk de problemen. Uh, 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 ze, op het moment dat ze zich begint thuis te voelen, uh, bij ons ook dan moeilijker uh, te doen. Uh, alles een vraag stellen, dat hier alles uh, revolteert en een uh, eindeloze discussie. Als je met een van mijn twee kinderen één moeilijk gaat, wat er dan voor je voorgevallen is, uh, dan pak ik mij op, haak dan naar middag een soep van mijn naast. Onmiddellijk. En ik kom echt heel goed. Als ik mijn kabas op pak en ik kom er wel op weer een punt dan steek en uh, pak het goed. Ja, maar dat moet ik niet. Long has been taught that by placing the child in a stable and warm family, that this would result in a reduction of their problems. This expectation, however, is not met. Most researchers found that emotional and behavioral problems in foster children remained stable or even increased during the foster care placement. What's the reason for this? Well, research shows us that problem behavior in foster children is largely associated with parenting stress and with a reduced sense of well-being in foster parents, which in turn influences the children's well-being. Several studies show that problem behavior in foster children is associated with less positive parenting strategies and with more negative control. It seems that a substantial group of foster parents try to contain, try to control, and try to correct problem behavior. And how do they do it? They start using more punishment, harsh punishment and inconsequent discipline. And at the same time, their supportive parenting behavior, their supervision, and their positive involvement with foster children decreases. <coughs> Subsequently, All foster care researchers agree that interventions aiming at improving the well-being of foster children and foster families are badly needed. Why did we choose for a non-violent resistance approach whilst other interventions already existed in foster care? Well, interventions used in foster care are usually attachment-focused or based on the social learning theory. Both, however, confront us with major problems. As a bridge from MDR to attachment is one of the main topics in this conference, it's interesting to look at what research tells us concerning attachment-based interventions. <coughs> Although attachment is a big issue in foster care in Flanders too, there is little empirical evidence <coughs> for the efficacy of interventions in foster care that are exclusively attachment-based. <coughs> Professor Bosmans, specialist in this field in Flanders, who so to speak up to now dedicated all his time on research on attachment, learned us at a recent conference that the attachment theory is important, but that it is also a bad theory. Why? 
because in many aspects it is poorly described with insufficiently clear definitions. There is no consensual definition or assessment strategy, nor are there established guidelines for treatment. Furthermore, within an attachment approach in foster care, the focus lies too exclusively on the understanding of the behavior of the child. This is very attractive for foster parents and for foster care workers because it offers an explanation for the behaviors and specific needs of foster children. It is, however, extremely important to find a balance between, on the one hand, understanding and showing empathy for the child's problems, and on the other hand, reacting to the behavioral problems. A balance that, in my opinion, can perfectly be found in the nonviolent resistance approach. If the problems of a foster child are framed too much within its history, foster parents might fail to do something about these behaviors, either by compassion with the foster child or by the assumption that they can't do anything about it. Moreover, until a few years ago, <coughs> even prominent researchers were convinced that the first years of life some explicitly mentioned the first six years of life, determined the development of attachment. This pessimistic, almost fatalistic vision made it useless to seek for treatment for health children because there was nothing to be done about it. Furthermore, in foster care, long has been taught that foster parents should not become too attached to foster children because foster care was seen as a temporary intervention, and this would complicate the return home. By now we know, everybody of us knows it, although I constantly meet clinicians and social workers who don't know yet, we know that every child attaches. Not being attached is impossible. We know that secure attachment cannot be taken along because attachment concerns a unique bond between a child and a caregiver. We know that children can have different attachment figures. And very important, we know that there is no age limit for the onset of secure attachment. But older, the older the child, the more time it takes and the more work it takes. And indeed, meta-analytic findings suggest that foster children show impressive, very impressive, catch-up after their placement. By now, the most important challenge is to come up with an intervention that focuses both on the bond between the child and the caregiver and on the behavioral problems. <coughs> I think this time will undoubtedly go into this in this lecture about the anchoring function. These key elements of positive child outcomes in foster care are well described in the nonviolent resistance approach. In building up their presence, their self-control, and a supportive network, foster parents establish a stable and warm relational framework and resist negative behaviors. Furthermore, and this is very interesting, they do it at the same time. Very other approaches also have paid attention to the relational and the limit setting of parenting. However, these two aspects are usually viewed as different aspects or different phases of the treatment. In this, the basic approach of NVR is quite unique. For example, one of the first things we ask foster parents to do already at the end of the intake session is to write an announcement. Foster parents are expected to enter the child's room, sit down on the floor, read the announcement, leave it behind and leave the room. In the announcement, we not only expect foster parents to declare in a respectful way the decision to resist two, maximum three, aggressive or self-destructive behaviors. We not only expect them to break the seal of silence and to seek support, but we also explicitly expect them to mention positive characteristics or strengths of their foster child. They hereby make a clear distinction between the child as a person and the child's behavior. For foster children, who usually have low self-esteem, in many cases, 
this has an, an, an unexpected impact. Und toen ik die brief uh, aan Diana gaf, was ze zelf eigenlijk, ik kon niet verwachten dat ze zo ging reageren, was bij eigenlijk zelf ook wel enorm verrast door de brief van, oh, tante, zo mooie dingen dat je daarin geschreven hebt. En ja, maar ik zei tegen haar, het stond er ook wel minder leuke dingen dan nee, dat nee, de dingen die wij niet zo leuk vinden en die me echt wel graag zo zou veranderen bij u. En, ja, ja, dat is zeker ik wel zes. Ja, als ik gereed van haar, maar die andere dingen zijn zo lief, zes. En ze heeft me altijd aan een brief bij. Aan haar brief had ik heel veel schip voor me in die artikel. Maar dat haar reacties al wat aan ze durft dan uh, bij van alles meer. En ik zei, ik heb eigenlijk iets voor jou, ik wil dat voorlezen. En uh, wat is dat misschien? Ik zeg, een brief kunnen uh, dat ik gewoon tot naar u schrijf. Ja, ik wil mij bij helemaal veranderen, zeker. Ik zeg juist niet. Ik zeg, het is een hulpmiddel om mezelf te veranderen, dat ik beter tegenover u kan reageren. Ik heb haar die voorgelezen. Ze heeft geluisterd met haar deur toe. Ik mocht de brief binnengooien. Ik weet niet wat ze ermee gedaan heeft. Ze is dan daarna bij mij op de kamer gekomen en ze heeft gezegd, oké, okay, jij wilt dat doen voor mij. Dan wil ik ook wel iets doen voor jou. Ik ga proberen wat meer uh, vriendelijker te zijn en niet zo rap uh, van mijn oren te maken. Dus, nee. Het heeft wel iets opgebracht, denk ik, want de verstandhouding tussen ons tweeën is helemaal anders. Eerst was ik nog wel, um, had ik een beetje weerstand tegenover zo'n brief. Ik vond dat heel formeel. Maar uh, toen we dat gedaan hadden, bleek dat, dat mijn pleegdochter daar, daar eigenlijk uh, heel blij mee was. Allee, ze vond dat heel voornaam dat ze zo'n brief had gekregen en ze bewaarde die ook in haar kamer onder haar kussen en ze las die af en toe opnieuw. Zo van, dat kan niet verder zo, dat, dat roepen, dat tieren, dat pijn doen aan, aan een broer en zus. En we hadden dat dan zo heel geknopt in een brief samen met ons bedrijfsperiode, dus daarin gezet. En de moment dat we die brief voorlazen, was dat kind gewoon super gelukkig. Ik vond dat eigenlijk heel belachelijk in het begin, een brief schrijven aan onze pleegdochter. Met een aantal punten die wij dus niet meer gaan aanvaarden, dus bijvoorbeeld het liegen of het, ver, het altijd het laatste woord willen hebben. Dat waren de twee actiepunten. Dat we dus, als dat gebeurde, dat we dat gewoon bij kinderen gingen aanvaarden. Ik had zoiets van ja. Dat ik maar zo die dan meer gaan vader in de brief, dan als we dat gewoon tegen haar zeggen. Maar we hebben dan ook dat toch maar gedaan. En we hebben die op een rustig moment aan de tafel gezeten en we hebben die brief voorgelezen. En ze heeft die brief opgevouwen en ze heeft gezegd, ik, ik ga ervoor, ik wil dat doen. En ze heeft die brief nog altijd bewaard, ze heeft nog altijd in haar mapje. Eerst dachten wij van, hmm, hoe gaat die dat opnemen van, hè? Een brief aan hem en dan met toch een paar negatieve punten tegenover hem in. Hè? En dan, waar ging het eigenlijk over? En die was toch zo super gelukkig van, allee, die doen hier wel iets met mij. Hè? Die proberen mij te helpen op de punt waar ik het nodig heb, waar ik het moeilijk mee heb. Dat was gewoon geweldig, echt waar. What a fantastic grandmother, isn't she? Let's take a look at other reasons to choose for a nonviolent resistance approach. In a recent review, only eight effective programs for foster parents were identified. Overall, these programs are based on the social learning frameworks, and they usually focus on young children. Only two programs include children under the age of 12. Moreover, a recent meta-analysis shows that parent training programs based on the social learning theory involving other children tend to be less effective, whilst programs based on NPR have shown themselves similarly applicable and helpful with younger children and adolescents. Finally, the following critical factors have been described in literature regarding support programs for foster First, the availability of a supportive social network is an important protective factor 
and is associated with lower stress levels in foster parents <coughs> and with more resilience in the face of difficulties. Research, however, showed that for a considerable group of foster parents, the supportive network was very limited, and for many, foster care workers were the main, if not only, if not the only source of support. The foster parents talk about PVO in the testimony I will show. PVO is the name of our project, thus just replace it by NPR. And the other one is the support team. I don't know if you're going to do that. Allee, een aantal vrienden en familie. En dan komt hij eigenlijk een beetje aan. We staan er toch wel open. Je gaat niet aan met je problemen bestraven. En dan, uh, dan is dat, dat is toch niet zo vanzelfsprekend. Maar eigenlijk, ik zeg die mensen worden er heel goed op, op gereageerd. En dat is ook heel nuttig. Hè, want oh, ten eerste, je krijgt een jonge hulp. Ja, ik was daar uiterst voorzichtig in. Eigenlijk een beetje omdat ik ondertussen al een aantal ervaringen had van eender veroordelende reacties. En mensen die het opgaven, of mensen die vonden dat ik het niet goed deed, of uh, vanuit mijn nabije omgeving. En ik was eigenlijk wat beducht op het feit dat als ik hiermee nu naar buiten kom, dan ga ik misschien terug veroordelen krijgen, of ga ik terug mensen afhaken. Um, want het, het zoeken en het vinden van sociale steun is een andere belangrijke uh, pijler eigenlijk in heel dat programma. En als ze daar zijn, dan kom ik eerst wel een beetje naar zijn. Ik probeer wel altijd heel veel mijn eigen plan te trekken en, en ik heb toch wel gemerkt dat ik af en toe wel hulp nodig heb. Uh, emotioneel ging het al wel, omdat ik mijn, mijn familie wel had om er een groot stuk op terug te vallen. Maar ook gewoon voor praktische zaken, om een keer even een uurtje op te passen of uh, om een keer uh, Rania vervroegd van school te halen als ik uh, niet op tijd thuis kon zijn, alleen zo van die dingen. En ja, dat vind ik toch zo niet gemakkelijk om te zien dat verdorie uh, hulp vragen. Nu, dat hebben we, uh, vooral ik willen afmaken, omdat ik zoiets had van, oké, okay, wij hebben nu onze verpleegster, ik moet mijn familie daar niet meer lastig van. Nu, die zagen ook aan ons dat het af en toe wel serieus moeilijk hadden en met familiebezoekjes, dat zij daar uh, heel koppig en uh, afwezig bij zat. En uh, ja, PVO heeft van verschillende keren moeten pushen aan ons van, doe dit, want je gaat er resultaat van hebben en eigenlijk is dat ook zo? En we hebben dan zo'n bijeenkomst georganiseerd. Um, en dat is eigenlijk een heel fijn moment geweest. Uh, waarbij dat ik dat we samen met, met de begeleidster dan, Tanja, heb kunnen vertellen waar we op dat moment aan toen mee bezig waren. En ook op, een beetje appel doen op, op mijn omgeving dan om mee te zoeken naar moeder zij, Lara, en mij daar mee kunnen in ondersteunen. <coughs> Interventions in foster care must also address foster parents' distress. This has been shown to be a crucial target for aiming at improving the foster child's well-being. The research of Fisher and Sumiller, you can find the reference of their interesting article at the bottom of this slide, provided important evidence for a connection between the foster parents' psychological state, the stress level, and the foster child's neurobiological stress and subsequent psychological assess uh, adjustment. As a creation of a supportive network for parents and addressing parenting stress are central aspects of the NPR approach, those are additional reasons to choose for NPR. Let's take a look at our treatment approach. Our intervention works from a standardized and individualized protocol. The training manual describes the theoretical background of the intervention and provides detailed guidelines for use. It outlines the sequence and contents of each individual session. This, in my opinion, is important as it not only makes it possible to perfectly replicate the interven both the intervention and the research elsewhere, it also helps therapists to address difficult topics and to overcome possible resistance. As part of the intervention, we also adapted the protocol developed by 
and Omar and his team to involve others in the treatment, and with remarkable success. In 87% of our two parent families, both foster parents were present at all sessions. In other cases, in other cases, foster fathers missed only one or only a few sessions. Certainly, not only the protocol to involve fathers is responsible for this, but also the fact that MVR is an acting program rather than a reflecting program. This is attractive for fathers. Fathers like to do rather than to talk. The manual describes how to address four intervention areas, namely prevention of escalation, activation of social support, the use of relation gestures, and acts of active resistance against problem behavior. It is, however, a flexible protocol. Each area is carefully addressed during the counseling, although not necessarily in a fixed sequence. Decision rules help the therapists to de determine the sequence of the interventions and to determine which actions aimed at increasing parental presence may be used. These decisions interrelay are based on the risk principle. The safety and protection of all parties involved must always be guaranteed. For example, in cases of high risk of aggression, act the activation of social support always will be put to the foreground. Furthermore, these rules are based on the need principle and also depend on the nature and severity of problem behavior, the age of the child, and the effectiveness. The intervention is offered as a combination of 10 individual sessions and weekly telephone support. Exceptionally, and well argued, we deviate from this number and a few sessions more or less can be offered. The total duration of our intervention is approximately four months. In order to ensure treatment integrity, bi-weekly supervision sessions were organized. They comprised a detailed case report combined with fidelity measurement through treatment checklists. This is essential. Literature on the implementation of interventions is unanimous. The main conclusion with far-reaching impact on the implementation process is that competent, well-selected therapists <coughs> who are perfectly trained and the solid training, training manual are insufficient to generate good results. Critical factors, critical components for implementation require continuous feedback, supervision, and structurally embedded monitoring of treatment integrity. Regarding treatment registration, our therapists, for example, carefully register the number and duration of all their sessions and telephone contacts. They register who was present and who was not. Within each intervention area, they register whether all aspects stipulated in the manual were treated, and which supporting materials were used and which were not used. They not only report on their own actions, but also on the actions of the foster parents. Did they do their homework? Did they engage, engage support? Did a supporters meeting took place? Who and how many people were present? Etc. Etc. By now, we must have treated approximately 200 foster families. If ever I find the time, an examination of these treatment checklists and additional outcomes should give us more insight about the specific ingredients of the intervention that might be especially important and effective. <coughs> Furthermore, the training manual contains specially developed materials including handouts, worksheets, DVD with role plays, and a DVD with some testimonies I have already have shown. And a workbook for foster parents, a workbook that consists of different brochures that is costless and freely available. Each brochure describes an intervention in an accessible, in an accessible manner and helps foster parents in addressing their home. The main adaptation, the main changes to the original program are linked to the specific characteristics of our target group. A first specific element to take into account 
is that foster parents usually are considered to be capable and skilled parents. After all, foster families are screened by foster care agencies. Subsequently, this makes it difficult for them to ask for help. In case of difficulties, a lot of foster parents feel they have failed. They feel ashamed. And sometimes they are afraid that the placement will be stopped if they break the seal of silence. They are afraid that they will be blamed that they fucked it up. As a matter of fact, in many, many cases, we, the foster care system and the broader care system, actually fucked it up. Because we placed a troubled child in their family, in their home, and we did not succeed in supporting them enough in what they need in order to give the foster children what they need. Therefore, the intervention is offered by foster care agencies carried out by experienced, specially trained foster care workers. Moreover, we use the home visit format not only because support offered to foster parents is based on a home visit model, but mainly to lower barriers to service access and to aim, enable the inclusion of difficult to reach families. I think Peter will address this topic more detailed in his lecture and workshop. 
What is important is recognizing foster children's needs can be difficult because there often is a lack of shared experience. Furthermore, foster parents often have insufficient information about the child's history. There are often dif differences in family cultures between the foster family and the biological family. Moreover, controlling and explosive behaviors often mask extreme vulnerabilities and unmet needs of foster children. Who, as I reported earlier, often experienced complex trauma and abuse resulting in low self-esteem. A crucial way to demonstrate unconditional care is to make and to maintain unconditional relation gestures. The impact is enhanced if foster parents succeed in gearing them to unmet needs of the child. Foster parents shift to see their gestures as symbolic of their parental presence and care. One way to facilitate this is by helping foster parents to look behind the behavior and to consider how the child may have been feeling, mentalization. To hypothesize about possible feelings of sadness, loss, anxiety that are often masked by difficult behavior. Foster parents, so to speak, have to get curious about what is behind the foster child's behavior. Some psychoeducation on how the brain functions of a traumatized, traumatized child in a state of anxiety. Psychoeducation on, on attachment can be helpful under the condition that it does not paralyze <coughs> foster parents. As said before, the balance has to be found between understanding and showing empathy for the child's problems and effectively reacting to the problem behavior. If a good balance is found, staying curious as to what may be behind the behavior means the foster parent is less likely to feel frustrated and is more likely to remain non-judgmental and manages to be escalated. In thinking about what fits the child's needs, it's also essential to take into account the emotional rather than the chronological age of the child and to take into account what a foster child can handle emotionally. What about the biological family of foster children? Where possible, 
initiatives are taken to start and maintain a positive dialogue with the family of origin. Foster parents are encouraged to create positive links. There are several ways in which we try to do this. First, foster parents invite members of the birth family to participate in what we call the album or box of positive memories, which only and is important is important, which only includes positive memories. It documents good times, positive opinions about the child, short histories, a ticket from a nice vacation, photos, and so on. In this way, a positive narrative is created. The intention is that foster parents involve other people and invite them to add positive memories too. Foster parents, for example, explain to parents and grandparents and significant others that they are creating such a box or album. They, for example, tell them, we know that you are very important to Amber. For her, it is very important that you are included. Can you name a positive characteristic of her? Mention something that was very important to you. Recall a positive memory. Do you have a photograph or another moment? Next, the foster parents can give the following message to the foster child. I talked to your grandma and I wanted to know which positive memories she had with you and I wrote them down in your album. The more people involved in this album, the greater the impact. Second, foster parents are stimulated to send out information about the welfare of the foster child, the cause of the placement and so on. By doing this, foster parents give the message, I cannot change your attitude towards me, I can only do what I feel is right, and I will keep on sending you these messages, no matter what. And thirdly, if feasible, members of the biological family are involved as a source of support. By stimulating foster parents to undertake such actions, we hope they succeed in reaching out to and strengthening the positive voices in the biological family, maybe even in meeting some of the parents' expectations. For the interested, more information can be found in this article. <coughs> now let's take a look at the study into effectiveness. The intervention was evaluated using a randomized controlled trial. Eligible foster parents were randomly assigned to an intervention group receiving the NPR intervention or a 
control group receiving treatment as usual. After data collection, the intervention was also offered <coughs> to the foster parents who were assigned to the control group. Foster parents were eligible to participate if their child was placed in long-time foster care, was uh, between 6 and 18 years old, and showed serious externalizing problem behavior. Foster mothers filled out a questionnaire at three points prior to the start of the intervention, immediately after the intervention, and at follow-up three months later. We chose to involve only foster mothers because almost a quarter of our sample consisted of single parent families parented by women. The following measures were used, child behavior problems, parenting stress, parenting practices, and the size of the supportive network was measured by asking father mo foster mothers to write down the number of people and, and the people who she could rely on for emotional support, for practical support, and for information and advice. Treatment in both the experimental and in the control group was carefully recorded. For the nurse among us, without going into detail, intention to treat was used to analyze the outcomes, analysis of covariance was used to analyze group differences, and besides statistical difference, currency effect sizes were calculated. Effect sizes should be interpreted as small than about. Medium when about 50 and large when about 28. A total of 62 foster families were assigned to the intervention or control group. It is a very heterogeneous group. There were mainly two parent families. The age of the foster parents ranged from 19 to 75 years. Most foster parents did not have eye education, half of the target children were boys, and their age. Uh, was ranged from 6 up to 17 years. Most foster children were pre previously placed in out of home care. And finally, which is important, almost 60% of the were kinship based units. Mostly grandparents taking care of their grandchildren. This is important as most intervention programs for foster parents target on non kinship foster families who usually are rather young, middle class, higher educated families with a greater likelihood of better outcomes. Let's first take a look at the interventions in both groups. Assessment of the data in the experimental group showed high fidelity of the therapist to the treatment protocol. In the left column, it tells us whether the therapist did what he was supposed to do. And the right column tells us what the foster parent brought into practice. As you can see, in each case, the intervention domains, the escalation, relation gestures, and increasing parental presence were covered. Involving external support was covered in 90% of the cases. In some cases, despite intensive efforts, it seemed undoable to deal with this issue. In addition, the extent to which the intended strategies were implemented by foster parents this was high. All foster parents reported in detail on their de-escalation and on reconciliation steps. In 39% of the cases, the biological family was involved in reconciliation and or support. 84% of the foster parents involved external support. In almost one of four cases, the supporters meeting was organized. Furthermore, all foster parents made use one or more of the techniques to increase their presence and resist problem behavior. The control group was given treatment as usual. As previous research shows, the support offered during the foster care placement varies widely. Uh, foster, uh, previous research shows that uh, support varies widely. Foster parents and farmers are supported by foster care agencies and they also have access to external mental health services. Treatment as usual, however, is rarely examined, although it is highly vulnerable to unintended intensification. To control for this, treatment was carefully recorded. Moreover, we, com we compared the treatment as usual that was offered in the control condition of our study 
with treatment as usual, provided to a carefully groomed, similar group of foster parents to take care of children with externalizing problems, but did not participate in a study. The results showed that being part of the control condition of our study was associated with higher counseling frequency from the foster care worker, as well as with three times more utilization of experimental <coughs> health services for foster parents, as well as for the foster child. Realizing that they were part of a control condition, although they wanted to benefit from extra support, clearly influenced the help-seeking behavior of foster parents and the counseling offered by the foster care workers. In other words, foster care workers and foster parents extremely started doing their best and really doing our research. <laughs> this on itself can be very promising and very cheap. Let's just put families in control conditions and foster care workers start working harder. As a result, the treatment as usual condition was actually a highly enhanced treatment as usual. This, of course, complicates the interpretation of our results. Let's take a look at the most important results. Regarding the foster child's behavior, the results seemed disappointing. Only in the long term, small positive trends were found, although comparison did not reach statistical significance. Nevertheless, these small effects are in line with the results of evidence-based programs for foster parents. Furthermore, those relatively modest gains might be explained by three factors. The treatment as usual condition that was the highly enhanced treatment as usual condition, which also resulted in a decrease in behavioral problems in the control group as you can see here. This of course was a pity for our research, but of course not for the families involved. It's difficult for our research. Second, the children in the study were older than the majority of studies regarding foster placement. It is known that improvements in difficult behavior are harder to achieve for older children. And thirdly, the population in this study consisted mainly of kinship foster parents it was relatively uneducated. A considerable proportion were single, elderly grandparents who are usually economically disadvantaged and poor in health. Those families usually have more difficulties in gaining from training. Regarding parenting stress, small positive trends were found in treatment conclusions, increasing to medium sized effects of follow up that are marginally significant. Furthermore, regarding experiencing problems, small positive trends, the treatment conclusion increased to medium sized significant differences in favor of intervention group. This is very important because even in cases where the behavioral problems remain, foster parents feel stronger and feel more competent to deal with. With regards to parenting practices, two interesting solutions were found. As follow-up, foster mothers of the intervention group significantly decreased the use of inconsequent punishment, and furthermore, made less use of discipline practices. The level of influences was marginally significant. Regarding experience support, there were some interesting evolutions. The number of persons foster mother could rely on for emotional support increased from a small size trend at treatment completion to significant effective follow up. It is very promising that even three months after completion of our, of our intervention, the emotional support keeps on growing. We see a similar trend for the number of people who provide practical support, although this difference is marginally significant. Concerning information and advice, we see an opposite trend. A significant large effect size difference in favor of the intervention group decreases to a medium sized non effective trend. This probably is a consequence of the termination 
of the intervention. Let's draw some final conclusions. NVR seems to be a highly acceptable intervention for foster parents. Indeed, I did not mention it before, no foster parent in the experimental group dropped out prematurely. This finding is in line with low dropout rates in other NPR studies that contrasts with the high dropout rates that affect many other parent training programs. In spite of small sample size, which reduces statistical power, and treatment as usual was highly enhanced, we found some satisfactory results. The NPR approach led to an increase in experience support and a decrease in parenting stress. As I mentioned before, two critical factors of foster parent interventions that in other research have shown to be associated with more resilience in foster parents on the children's well-being and neurobiological stress. Furthermore, the intervention led to some positive changes in parenting practices. A few years ago, our project was awarded a prize, which, and I quote, aims to reward an important original work in the field of child and adolescent psychiatry and or child psychotherapy. Furthermore, after ending the experimental phase in 2014, this intervention was implemented in regular foster care in Flanders and now can be offered to every foster family. Moreover, the number of therapists increased from 6 to 13. Which is interesting too, is that the first colleagues from foster care organizations in the Netherlands started to experiment with our intervention. I hope I can get them crazy enough to start with empirical research too, to learn from our mistakes and to do it better. Finally, let me end with a little story. In 2012, the day before the second international conference in Antwerp. I was walking around with Kain, showing him the city. We were constantly talking about NPR, the new authority, new applications, research, and after a few hours, Kain asked me, Frank, or said, Frank, let's talk about important things. <laughs> Do you like football? <laughs> And we start talking about football. Well, in light of the European Championship next month, let me end with important things. <laughs> we are going to miss the Netherlands and Denmark. <laughs> that really is a pity. And for our Swedish colleagues, as Belgium is going to play against Slavon and his team, I have a take-home message. And it is not a non-violent resistance game. <laughs> I hope I will pronounce it right. Wir sagten, wie kommen wir wieder über